But as far as we know, in general, the only way to do that is to actually find P and Q. But interesting problem. To, it might, might it be a little easier? Okay. <laughs> How about the Al Gamal system, which is based on the discrete log problem? Well, this introduces some randomness. I mentioned some randomness with the CVP in, in a second ago, but let me talk about it a little more. Almost all secure cryptography relies on having a source of randomness. I'm going to talk about that a little later. Um, those at Christel's talk realize that it really makes a difference. If someone can um, subvert your source of random bits, they basically completely um, compromised everything you do. Anyway, so here's how El Gamal works. The public key, well, we, we're working mod P, pick some, your favorite big prime. Um, you take a G, so you're looking at G mod P, and you raise G to the secret power, G to the K mod P. Okay, so B Bob knows these three numbers, Eve knew, knows these three numbers, but presumably it's hard for them to figure out what K is. So Bob wants to send the message M, which will be a number mod P. So he chooses a random number mod P minus one. Okay, so let's assume he has a way to do that. And then the ciphertext is not a single number, it's a pair of numbers. First, Bob takes the number G, which is in the you know, public, and raises it to this secret random number he chose, mod P. And he sends Alice C1. Alice cannot figure out what R is, right? Because she knows G to the R, but finding R is the discrete log problem. But Alice gets to see C1. Eve gets to see C1. Bob also takes G to the K, which remember Alice has published, raises that to his secret power, and multiplies it by his message and reduces mod P. So he sends Alice these two numbers. And how does Alice decrypt? Well, I'm going to give you the formula, and it'll, it's fun for you to figure out why. It, it's just a little bit of algebra, but it's fun for you to do. Um, she takes the C1 that Bob sent her. She raises it to her secret power. She inverts it mod P. Inversion mod P is, is just the Euclidean algorithm. That's really quick. She multiplies it by the other part of the ciphertext, the C2, and reduces mod P. And that will get Bob's message back. You could almost do this in your head, probably. But if not, write it down. I will mention, you may notice the parentheses around the C to the K here are, look kind of different. That's because I forgot to type them in, la in LaTeX, so they're not on the slides when you go look at them. So it looks like C1 to the K minus 1 power, which is not right. Okay? So I did warn you about typos. Um, elliptic curl El Gamal works identically except every place where I'm raising to a power, I'm instead adding the point in the elliptic curve that many times. It's just group law. Just replace multiplication group law by elliptic curve group law. Okay. And again, I've cheated a little bit. The underlying hard problem that Eve has to solve to read Bob's message is not actually finding Alice's secret K. What does she need to do? She's given, well, I've kind of done it abstractly down here. What does Eve know, right, the eavesdropper? She knows G to the R. Well, actually, no, let's take it back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think it's, this isn't entirely, I claim that if you can solve this Diffie-Hellman problem, then you can break Eve's crypto system, even though you don't know what K is. And the problem you have to solve, I'll give you G, I'll give you G to some power, I won't tell you what A is, I'll give you G to some other power, I won't tell you what B is, 
And I'm not requiring you to find A and B. I'm just requiring you to compute G to the A times B power. Okay. And again, as far as we know, the only way to do that in general is to actually find A and B. But maybe there's a clever way um, to do it. I mean, you can kind of see there's no natural way to multiply G to the A's and G to the B's and get G to the AB. Because when you multiply G to the A times G to the B, despite what most of our calculus students think, you do not get G to the A times B power. You get G to the A plus B power. All right. If the way is to find A and B, then Alice would need to find the random number of. Um, right, except that... But Alice has good. Alice has published G to the. Alice doesn't need to find G to, doesn't need to find R because Alice has published G to the K, so she actually knows what the K is. So she knows the solution to the discrete log for G to the K because she created. It. And if you look at how El Gamal works, it's that number that you need, and the the G to the R gets canceled out in the decryption process. So Alice never does figure out what G, what R is. Yeah. Is that, that's fine. Okay, so the th third, fourth, however we're counting, the CVP hard problem. Um, how do you turn that into a yeah, quick question? Yep. Uh, how much would it matter if you could figure out R? How much would it matter if you could figure out R? If you can figure out R, you can decrypt. So the answer is, it's a disaster if Bob generates R in some way that's compromised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, you should, every, every system we come up with that has some randomness built in, you should check that if someone compromises the randomness, they can break the system. It's almost always the case. Yeah, good question. Okay. So um, next time I'll describe um, two ways to use CVP to create crypto systems. One of them called GGH, the other called NTRUE. GGH is relatively straightforward. It's more or less what I wrote earlier. Its problem is that it, it has very, very large key sizes. So NTRUE uses those sort of special lattices to, to make that, um, to help solve that problem. But since that's not the topic of this, yeah, okay. So that's not the topic of today's lecture, so I am just going to leave it to say, come back on Friday. Uh, th come back on Thursday and Friday. But I will mention that next week, uh, Kristen Lauder is going to give a series of talks about using elliptic curves to create public key crypto systems and probably digital signatures also, which we'll get to in a minute, but not using the elliptic curve discrete log problem, using a different problem which, again, people think and hope is harder than the elliptic curve discrete log problem, um, which is based on isogenies, which are, isogeny is just a fancy word for a homomorphism from one elliptic curve to another. Um, so that's a preview for next week. Okay, so up till now I've been talking about what are called public key crypto systems. That's, I want to send a message to someone in the back row there. Um, the person in the back row has published their public key, so I can do that. Um, but all of you sitting in between can't decrypt the message because you don't know that person's private key. That's one of many aspects, an important part, but um, many aspects of, of um, well, public key cryptography in general. The other really, really important part are what's called digital signatures. And in some sense, they're almost more important than um, encryption methods. Okay, so what's a digital signature? Well, let's start with what's a signature that's not digital. So you're all familiar with it. Well, actually, I shouldn't say this. Once upon a time, all of you would have been familiar with having a physical check, and you write, pay to X $20, and you write your signature on it. That was your signature. So here's a check that Bob is sending Alice $100. And how does the bank know that that's 
actually a check that they should cash? Well, because they can see Bob's signature at the bottom and they have a copy of his signature on record. This is not a good model for electronic things, right? So now, instead of signing a check like that, uh, Bob has this digital file, okay? And he wants to send it to Alice. Actually, he wants to send it to the whole world, okay? But he wants to prove that it's really from him. So he wants to sign that file. It could be, I don't know, an audio file, a video file, uh, a PDF, whatever. He wants uh, an NFT, right? He wants to prove that it's his, that he's the one who created it and no one else. And he does that using what's called a digital signature. And just one example to keep in mind, which will give you an idea of how important this is. How many people have apps on their phones? How many people's apps on their phones have been updated sometime in the last month or year? Everyone's. How do you know that those updates don't contain all kinds of malicious software? The answer is the updates. When you install the original app, it has, um, the public key for your digital signature from that company. And when the company sends you an update, it checks that the, that the file actually came from that company. Okay? So basically, none of um, the way apps work really could function without digital signatures unless the world was a nice, safe place where there were no bad people. Um, and that would be nice. But... Okay, here's how digital signatures work mathematically. I'm waiting for time. Yeah. So, the idea is Bob ha has a digital document he wants to sign. He uses his private signing key. And there's a signing function, and what comes out is a signature. Then the verification function takes three inputs. It takes Bob's public key. It takes the signature that Bob got from the, when he signed his document, and it takes the document. And the output is just one bit. Yes, it's valid, or no, it's not valid. And what you want this to satisfy is that if you have a valid public-private key pair, then when you ap apply the verification function to the public key, the signature, and the document, you'll get yes if and only if the signature here came from signing using Bob's private key. So the only way to create a valid signature is to know the private key. It's not so easy to think how to do it. It's actually harder to, to build these generally than it is to build public key crypto systems. And um, we'll get to why, especially on Friday. Because there's sort of an extra attack. <laughs> anyway, here's how RSA works. I'm going to go through these really quickly. You, if you haven't seen them, you should look at them in the problem session and check that they actually work. Which again is, 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 is a bunch of fun number theory and algebra. But RSA signatures, it's the same setup with the product of the primes and the exponents, but now the private key is the solution to that congruence that was used to decrypt before. Um, the document's in number D. Bob raises his document to this secret power, and that's his signature. And checking that the signature is valid, Alice takes the si supposed signature, raises it to the E power where that was published, and checks that it, she, got, she gets the document back. Okay. Um, good. Elgamal signatures. These are significantly more complicated. I actually I encourage you to go and read them in detail. I only want to pinpoint one thing. Well, two things. One, they, Elgamal signatures also depend on choosing a random number. 
But, and they also have two parts to them. So the signature consists of two numbers. That's not, that's fine. And it doubles the length. We're talking bits, not even, you know, not even kilobytes. Um, but the slightly weird thing about al signatures, which still gives me a little bit of disquiet, is this random number R appears as an exponent on the first piece of the signature, and it appears sort of in the linear, not as an exponent in the second part. So that's a little weird. Um, although this S2 in some sense, because it's P minus one, it, you kind of think of it as being exponent-wise. Anyway, um, and it's a fun exercise to check that the signature will be valid provided this quantity equals this quantity. Um, and that can be checked um, because G to the K was published. But to create this signature, you actually need to know the K. All right. And lattice-based signatures we will talk about on Friday. Okay, so we've talked about public key crypto systems, that often called encryption schemes, how you send messages, digital signatures, how you prove that a digital file is actually yours. But there are a whole bunch of underlying technical problems, a couple of which I want to talk about. The first is, suppose that the document that Bob wants to sign is a video file of a movie, okay? We're talking gigabytes, okay? These en encryption schemes, the, the signatures, I mean, the documents you're signing are numbers mod PQ, for example, if you're using RSA. P times Q is 2,000 bits, 4,000 bits. So what Bob would be doing is signing every 4,000-bit chunk of this 20-gigabyte file. That's inefficient. And it has the added problem that it means that each part of the file is sort of signed separately. <laughs> Um, so, so the file isn't tied together. So what people do instead is they sign what's called a, a hash function. If you've taken CS classes, you've probably seen hash functions and hash tables. They're used for sorting, efficient sorting and stuff like that. These are a little trickier because the hash function has to be what's called cryptographically secure, which I will tell you about in a moment. So what happens is Bob takes this huge document, he runs it through a hash function, and he actually signs the hash value, not the document itself. So the intuition is a hash function takes some huge file, some arbitrary length set of bits, gigabytes, it's a function, it takes that as input, it's supposed to be very, very fast and it outputs a single bit string containing B bits. And you just choose B big enough basically so that people can't find strings in here by brute force searches. Cheating a little bit. So here are the properties that we need the hash function to have to use for cryptography. These are not necessary, sorry, not necessary for most computer science applications, but they're crucial for crypto. Okay, so you have your document, zero, one to the star, the nota that's notation for a finite but arbitrarily long bit string, okay? This, you know, set zero, one raised to the nth power for some begin. So computing it should be very fast. Remember that we always want efficiency. However, if I give you a target string, I just give you some B-bit string that I've chosen at random. It should be very, very difficult for you to find any string at all which hits that one. Now you can do it by brute force eventually, right? If you try two to the B different inputs, you should have, a, well, at least a 50-50 chance of getting it. If you, if you choose three to the B inputs, you'll almost certainly hit it. But we'll make B big enough, you can't do that. Um, 
And it's usually good to have what's something even a little stronger, which is called uh, collision resistance, which means not only can't you hit a target here that I give you, you also can't find two different input strings that give the same output. Okay. And the final thing, which I guess we don't need because it's blocked by the uh, blackboards. I don't know if you can read that. I'll read it for you. It says altering one bit of the input affects every bit of the output in a random way. Okay? So, if I take that movie file and I flip one of the bits, the output of the hash will, will look completely different. Okay. Now, the other thing that one wants, as we've seen, are random numbers. Alkamal uses random numbers. Um, the lattice-based systems, as we'll see tomorrow, use random numbers. RSA doesn't, if, right? If you look at it, that's actually not a good feature, that's a flaw in RSA, and people usually build some randomness into the encryption process, precisely to improve security, okay? Um, so here is a semi-realistic example of how one would build some randomness in, regardless of what crypto system you're doing, it's a good idea to do this before you transmit your, mes your message. Okay, so Bob wants to send the message M to Alice. So he chooses a random number, random string of bits, to say it's the same length as M. And he sends Alice, oh, this double vertical is concatenation. Um, so computer science notation. So he sends Alice the bit string R and he also XORs R with the message M. So again, computer science, XORing, you just take each bit and of the message and each bit of the random string and XOR them. Or if you're not a computer science, you take the each bit in the message and the bit in the random, so you have two bits, two numbers, zero and one, add the mod two. So XOR to me is just a fancy way of writing, add the coordinates mod two. Anyway, so, and, and then, you know, so he can't send this M prime directly to Alice. He now uses some crypto system to encrypt it and he sends M prime, the encrypted M prime to Alice. She decrypts it to get M prime back, but then once she has M prime, she knows R, and she knows R, X, or M, so she can simply take the R, X, or M, which was part of the um, plain text, it looks like plain text, and XOR it with the R, and the, if you XOR with the same thing twice, it goes away. Why? Because mod two, if you add something to itself, it's zero. <laughs> now, this is not what's really done. The problem with this is that the kth bit of R affects the kth bit of M. But what you really want is every bit of R to affect every bit of M. So people do things that are much more complicated. But the underlying 